Hey everybody, I'm Yvonne Williams with Back to Earth Creations and in this video I wanted to talk to y'all about lilies in the edible landscape. They are not edible. These ones aren't, at least. You can eat day lilies, which are a different family of lily, but still like, lily's a very like umbrella name that can encompass a lot of things from Asiatic lilies, trumpet lilies, day lilies, even um, plantains or like hostas. Are considered like some people call those lilies um so it's it's a very broad spectrum I am not good at pronouncing things so there should be like a word right here maybe of the kind of lily that I'm talking about predominantly um, in this video and then also maybe a word showing up right here if I can figure out how to edit videos um, that is day lilies and that way you can google it and, uh, for yourself and kind of do a little bit more research because that's what I'd like to encourage is for you to research it for your own purposes and your own applications and kind of find maybe which one's your favorite. These are Asiatic lilies. They do really well in zone 6B where I currently live, but I have also grown them very successfully down in zones 7 and 8, round about there. They do really well with their heads in the sun and then their feet in the shade. They like a kind of cool soil to grow out of. Um, these ones, I don't have to water them at all. Like they're a perennial, so they have a really nicely established root system. Whenever you're planting your lilies, the bulb is kind of this shaped. It'll have kind of a point at the top, little roots coming out of the bottom, and it's made out of scales, but doesn't have like, um, like how an onion has that papery wrapping on it. It doesn't have a papery wrapping. They're just bare naked scales. Um, I try to leave the bulbs intact, and then if your bulb is, let's say this big, that it would be quite large, but let's just pretend if it's this big, you want to plant it boop, 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 with enough space above that bulb to fit two more of itself. So if it's two inches in height, you want to plant it four inches deep. I hope that that like, makes sense. Um, but in that way, I mean, you, you want to give it a very good start. Uh, I usually layer just a bunch of old compost and like bunny berries, like um, the partially decomposed rabbit poop, um, into the beds once a year and I get blooms out of them for weeks and weeks. So, hey pretty chicken. <laughs> in the edible landscape, I really like growing lilies in and among herbs and like this is actually an excellent example of why to not plant your lilies in with climbing vines because the climbing vines will just, whether it's pole beans or cucumbers, anything that sends out tendrils, peas or something, like it could totally take over the plant and you don't necessarily want that. And so that's why I try to not plant um, lilies in with cucumbers or vining gourds or pole beans or anything that's going to be climbing up them because we, even with, with their upright sturdy habit, plants are going to see them as like a trellis opportunity. And so you want to kind of protect them from that because especially with morning glories and things like that, they could tear your lilies down and just kind of decimate them. Plants that my lilies do really well in and among other than herbs are bush beans, peppers, eggplants. If you have any kinds of, oh, there's a firefly, sorry. If you have any kinds of like um, determinate tomatoes that they just aren't gonna get very big, um, you could kind of plant them around in there. But keep in mind the height of the lilies that you're gonna be planting and then the heights of the plants. So like with these ones, they're about three feet tall. So I would plant my basils and my peppers and stuff kind of in front of them. If I have them lined up here, I have them lined up against a, um, a fence line or you could put them in the center of the bed and actually use them to shade your late spring, early summer spinaches and other greens to kind of prolong their season a little bit. So use them to give you a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, anytime that I'm using a perennial bulb, I will try to not plant it in with carrots or potatoes or sweet potatoes or beets or anything where I'm heart radishes. I don't want to be disturbing the roots of the soil. So anything that I plant in with the lilies, I'm going to try to make sure um, is having an above ground harvest. That way I can just kind of let them be. Now, as far as daylilies go, they have a very different structure. They have more of a root clump than a tuberous bulb the way that these style of lilies do. And that's, um, if I can pronounce it, I'm gonna try to pronounce it correctly. Hermeocallus, 
no, that wasn't right. Um, <laughs> but day lilies, and they're called that because while these lilies, this blooms freshly opened, this one hasn't opened yet, and then this one's actually starting to fade. Their blooms will last quite a few days, whereas with a day lily, each bloom only lasts for one day. Here you can see, this is a spent day lily, and these are the upcoming buds. But they set so many flowers and are constantly sending up new spikes of, uh, you know, with blooms on them that you get like a really long uh, bloom time out of the daylilies. But they also have like a leafy clump of growth, kind of, it almost looks like a really thick grass uh, whenever your daylilies are growing. So they can be used, I like them a lot for bordering beds or edging along walkways and they also like full sun so that's really great and um, just even this past couple of weeks it's been 90 degrees almost every single day and it has not rained a whole lot so like it hasn't rained in like a week and these flowers are still going really strong so while I don't have much of a vegetable harvest coming in yet like my tomatoes aren't ready, my peppers aren't ready, like a lot of those things. My beans are just starting to set flower. Um, the heat's really hard on everything, but I can come out and really enjoy their beautiful blooms. Now also, lilies are fantastic for pollinators. They produce a lot of really sweet nectar, so that's really cool. And then so I try to plant lots of uh, yellows and reds to attract hummingbirds and bumblebees. And then also, um, as far as pests go, other than the chickens digging them up, they don't eat them, they just dig them up because they're jerks. Um, <laughs> but other than uh, just like the neighbor's kids picking them or cats like laying on them, <laughs> the only pests that I run into are bulb flies, um, which they do feed on the nectar, which doesn't hurt the plant, but they also eat the plant tissues, which can, if you get just a huge, like, just swarm of bulb flies, can do quite a bit of the damage to the plant, as well as thrips, um, which also eat the plant matter. But the best way that I've found organically to control that is to just make sure that I have really strong plants. Um, by promoting a permaculture environment where, um, you know, everything's mulched well, there's a lot of moisture conservation in the soil, their roots aren't constantly being disturbed, they have lots of, you know, other bugs coming around to eat the bad bugs. And I'm really dumbing this down a bit, but it's like, in general, I try to keep a healthy circle of life going, and by not using pesticides, I'm not eliminating entire portions of the, the you know, food chain, which causes imbalances, which can cause you, you know, your predators to die off be, or leave because there just aren't, isn't enough food. And then suddenly you get another rise in pests. So if I see a little bit of damage, if I can manage some hand picking, I'll do that. But for the most part, I just try to keep the plant happy and healthy through proper nutrition and watering it and making sure that, you know, like this, this bed has had been in shade since about four o'clock this afternoon. So in the full height of summer, they're not getting too sun scalded. And it's if it gets too hot and sunny for them, they'll just get a little bit of burning on the ends of the petals and the, the blooms will fade faster. But fortunately that hasn't been too much of a problem. So while you, the bulbs of the or the bulbs and the blooms and the greenery of the Asiatic lilies are not edible, I think it's important to have plants in your garden that are also just pretty um, and interactive and if they attract and feed beneficial insects and pollinators that's a bonus and if they're beautiful and smell good that's a bonus because sometimes it might not be food for your mouth it might be food for your soul so and that's lilies are definitely one of those things they're just so bright and happy you guys they're probably one of my favorite flowers but I think I say that about every flower too so there's no telling um, but thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, or any requests for future um, urban agriculture, edible landscaping, backyard homestead um, <laughs> videos, please leave a comment down below. I love hearing from you guys. And um, if you enjoy all of my videos and stuff and would like to support the creation of more of them, please check out all the links down in the video description uh, where you can find some books that I recommend for if you want to get into gardening for yourself or just do a little bit more research. And then also my social media and even my Patreon if you want to participate in my different fairy house giveaways and things. 
which speaking of which this is one of my little modified out fairy houses that I really enjoy having out in the garden and I do monthly giveaways of those over on my patreon so be sure to check that out Thank you so much for watching though you guys and I really hope until next time everything grows wonderfully in your garden and uh, good luck in everything that you do. But we'll see you around. Bye! <laughs>